you're watching TK Physical Education. In this episode, we're gonna be looking at the skeletal system and covering the main facts that we need to know for the GCSE PE on this topic. So let's start by looking at the skeleton as a whole and going through some of the facts about each bone. So we we'll start from the top. We have the cranium, which is made up of several flat bones, which are fused together within the cranium with fixed immovable joints so that the cranium can do its function of protection so the cranium can protect the brain when we play sport. We also have the mandible which is an irregular bone, the jaw bone because of its irregular shape. Other irregular bones we have are the vertebral column so the spine is made up of 33 individual ir irregular shaped vertebrae which are joined together with cartilage in between which allows small amount of movement and the flexibility of the spine. We then have the ribs, which are flat bones, and the sternum, also a flat bone, and they work together to offer protection for our vital organs such as the heart and the lungs. There's a slightly movable joint between the ribs and the sternum. In the shoulder girdle, we have the clavicle, which is a flat bone, and also the scapula, the, the, so the shoulder blade here, the scapula, and these make up the ball and socket joint of the shoulder. We then have the humerus, which is a long bone at the top of the arm. Now this bone is involved in movement at the ball and socket joint, but it's also going to be involved with blood production in the marrow of the bone and mineral storage, calcium and phosphorus, which are stored in the bone for bone strength. In the lower arm, we have the radius, which is in line with the thumb, which is a long bone, and also a long bone here, the ulna, in line with the little finger. Going down the wrist, we have the carpals, which are very small bones which help to facilitate movement and support the joint. We have the metacarpals at the top of the hand, which are long bones, and also long bones of the phalanges. Although they are reasonably short, they are classified as long bones. Next, we have the pelvis, which is involved in protection of our intestines and also forms uh, the uh, socket for the ball and socket joint of the hip. We have the femur, which is a long bone at the top of the leg, again in involved in movement, blood production and mineral storage. In the knee, we have the patella, which is an irregular bone, but it's classified as sesamoid because it actually floats within a tendon. In the lower leg, we have the tibia, which is our shin bone. This is a long bone. To the side of the tibia, we have a slightly smaller bone called the fibula, and similarly to the wrist, in the ankle, we have the tarsals, which are short bones in the ankle, the metatarsals on the top of the foot, and the phalanges, which are long bones of the toes. The functions of the skeletal system. So we need to look at each function and understand how it aids a performer in physical activity. So the first function would be shape and support. The skeleton provides us with the framework and rigidity for our bodies. And a sports example of this could be to stand tall to block a shot in netball or basketball. The next function of the skeleton would be movement. Now movement is extremely important in physical activity. And this is possible because of the skeleton for two reasons. Firstly, because we have synovial joints or movable joints in the body to offer that movement. And we also have the muscles attached to the bones via tendons, and this makes movement possible at a joint. An example would be serving a ball in tennis um, or running with, with a football. Uh, the next function of the skeleton, which is important for us in physical activity, is the fact of blood production. So the skeleton produces blood cells within the bone marrow of the long bones clearly a benefit for the sports player because we need red blood cells to carry oxygen to our muscles so we can keep going. Another function of the skeleton would be mineral storage. So within the cells of the bones, we can in fact find certain minerals, for example, calcium and phosphorus, which help with bone strength and teeth strength. Um, and there'll be other minerals found within the bones which help with various functions in the body. The final function of the bones that we need to understand is that of protection. So the bones will also offer us protection. For example, the ribs and the sternum here will protect the heart and the lungs, and the cranium will obviously protect the brain from any damage when we're playing sport. An example could be headering a ball in football means that the brain is not damaged by the ball when it contacts the cranium. <laughs> 
Joints. A joint can be defined as a place where two or more bones meet. There doesn't necessarily have to be movement there for it to be defined as a joint. So we have three types of joint in the body or three classifications of joint. We have the fixed joints, which can be found between the bones of the cranium and also between the bones of the sacrum and coccyx, no movement possible. We also have slightly movable joints. These can be found in between the bones of the vertebrae and also between the sternum and the ribs as a slightly movable joint. The other joints of the body are the freely movable joints, also known as synovial joints, where lots of movement is possible. Now, the synovial joints can be split into six different types or categories. So the first one we have is the hinge joint. This can be found at the elbow, also the knee, the flanges of the toes and the fingers, and to some extent the, the ankle is also a hinge joint. So um, the hinge joint allows us just to move in an open and close movement. We're going to look at the movement terms in more detail. The next joint we have is the ball and socket joint. And this is the, the shoulder girdle here making up the socket and the ball being the, the top of the humerus here and it makes up the ball and socket joint of the shoulder. We also have a ball and socket joint at the hip with the pelvis being the socket and the femur being the ball for that joint. The next type of joint we have is a pivot joint. Now this is a joint that um, one bone in fact pivots inside another bone and this can be found at the atlas and axes which are the top two bones of the vertebral column. Um, and this allows us to move our head to the side and up and down in, in, in a pivoting motion. We also have a pivot joint uh, below the elbow in a joint called the radio ulna and this allows us to do this movement of the wrist and this movement is termed supination and pronation of, of the hand. The next type of joint that we have is called a condyloid joint. This is similar to a ball and socket joint but less, less so fitting inside a socket so it's two bones that, that move against each other in a rotating way like this. Um, which allows the wrist to do a similar movement, but, but slightly different. We then have the saddle joint, which means the thumb is actually clipped on almost like a saddle um, and allows a slightly different movement. And finally, we have a type of joint called gliding joints, which can be found between the vertebrae and allow the bones to glide against one another. joints. We need to be able to describe a sporting movement and the movement that takes place at each of the synovial joints. Um, in order to do this we need to be aware of the anatomical position which is this standing forwards with your palms facing, facing the front. So flexion at the elbow would be to bend the arms at the elbow like this coming forward from that anatomical position. Closing the angle at the joint. So flexion is to close the angle at the joint. Extension at the elbow would be to straighten the arms. We can also have flexion and extension at the shoulder and the hip and other parts of the body. So anything moving forward from the anatomical position would be flexion. For example, the shoulder, this would be flexion and moving back from the anatomical position would be extension. Same at the hip, flexion at the hip and extension at the hip. The exception to that rule of coming forwards from the anatomical position for flexion and backwards for extension would be at the knee where obviously to bend the knee is flexion and that moves, moves the joint backwards. Extension at the knee would be to straighten the leg. The next movements that we have are abduction and adduction. So this can be done at the shoulder and the hip. So at the shoulder, abduction would be to move away from the midline of the body. The midline of the body is an imaginary line coming down the center. So away from it is abduction because the limbs have been abducted from the body. And then adduction is to add to the body. So adduction towards the midline of the body or even across it. Same at the hip, we have abduction away from the body and adduction towards the midline or even across it. We also have rotation, which is turning around a central point. For example, to turn the whole body or to turn a limb around a central point or to do a somersault. Um, we also have a movement at the limbs, which is called circumduction, where we move the limb in a circular motion. This can also be done at the hip. And then we have more specific movements. For example, um, at the lower arm, we have the radio ulnar joint, which allows for supination to turn the palms up and pronation down. So supination up and pronation down. At the ankle joint, 
we have two movements very specific. So to put the toes down, we have a movement which is called plantar flexion. And to lift the toes up, we have a movement which is called dorsiflexion.